Humans and other vertebrates are deuterostomes. Before we examine the phylum to which we belong, let's look at the other large phylum of deuterostomes, the echinoderms. Sea stars, also called starfish, are echinoderms. Brittle stars, basket stars, sea urchins, sand dollars, sea cucumbers, and sea lilies are also members of this group. Do you notice something strange about this group of bilateral animals? What's most unusual about them, considering their place in the animal family tree? Check the box next to your answer, then click Submit. Sorry, that's not the best answer. That's right! Although all these statements about echinoderms are true, the fact that's most surprising is that these bilateral animals have radial symmetry, like the radiate animals. Echinoderms only show their bilateral nature clearly when they're immature, as in the larvae shown on the screen. As we'll often find in the study of animal relationships, the traits that characterize a group may appear only at particular stages of an animal's life cycle. The typical adult echinoderm, such as a sea star, lacks a head and has a decentralized nervous system without a brain. Echinoderms have two additional important distinctions. They have an internal skeleton of calcified plates covered by a layer of skin. They also have a water vascular system, a system of channels through which seawater can flow inside the body of the animal, including the echinoderm's hollow tube feet. The water vascular system functions in locomotion, feeding, and gas exchange. The other large phylum of deuterostomes is the one to which we humans belong, the chordates. All vertebrates are members of this phylum, but there are also some invertebrate chordates, such as lancelets and tunicates, or sea squirts. Chordates are distinguished by some important morphological traits. The figure on the screen is a generalized diagram of a chordate body, viewed from the side. At some point in their development, all chordates have a notochord, a flexible, supportive rod of tissue running through the back of the animal. In vertebrates, this rod is replaced by the vertebral column later in development. Chordates also have a hollow nerve cord. In vertebrates, this becomes the spinal cord and brain of the adult. Chordates have a distinctive feature associated with their pharynx, the part of the digestive tract that follows the mouth. The pharynx of a chordate has slits that open to the outside of the animal. The slits develop into structures involved in feeding, breathing, and hearing. Most chordates also have a tail extending beyond the anus at some point in their development. Vertebrates are a subgroup of chordates, distinguished by their vertebral column or backbone, composed of hard segments called vertebrae. The vertebral column is the main supportive structure for the vertebrate's body. Vertebrates also have a protective brain case, which together with the vertebral column, protects the animal's central nervous system. These features, along with their well-developed sensory organs, are adaptations that allow for large size and quick movement. The first vertebrates were aquatic creatures. Their fossils trace back to the Cambrian period. By the end of the Silurian period, vertebrates with jaws had appeared. The vertebrate jaw is hinged and works up and down. It was an important adaptation for feeding, and most vertebrates today have jaws. The lamprey, a jawless fish with a sucker mouth, is an exception. The evolution of the jaw allowed vertebrates to dominate the seas, and soon after, vertebrates invaded the land. We'll look at their descendants, the present-day fishes and land vertebrates, next. The first jawed vertebrates were fishes. The two groups of jawed fishes living today are distinguished by their skeletons. Cartilaginous fishes have skeletons composed of cartilage, a strong but flexible tissue. These are the sharks and rays and their relatives. All other jawed fishes are known as bony fishes. They have skeletons composed of bone. In addition to the gills used for gas exchange underwater, 
A few living bony fishes have lungs for breathing air. It's likely that a prehistoric air-breathing fish, related to modern lung fish, gave rise to the first land vertebrate, an ancient amphibian. Early amphibians and all their evolutionary descendants are known as tetrapods. This word means four feet, a trait of most modern land vertebrates. The first fossil amphibians date to the late Devonian period, over 350 million years ago. Like their modern relatives, such as frogs and salamanders, the first amphibians depended on liquid water for survival. Most present-day amphibians spend part or all of their lives in the water. The next important adaptations to appear enabled vertebrates to fully colonize the land and reduced their dependence on liquid water. The first fully terrestrial vertebrates evolved from ancient amphibians. Today, we would probably consider these animals reptiles. They had tough, waterproof skin and laid eggs with shells that retain water on land. The descendants of these first reptiles are a monophyletic group including all living reptiles, birds, and mammals. These animals are called amniotes, after a feature of their eggs. Reptiles expanded and diversified at the end of the Paleozoic era and became the dominant land vertebrates during the Mesozoic era. The Mesozoic era is frequently called the Age of Reptiles. Those reptiles were far more diverse than the reptiles of today. There were dinosaurs on land, flying reptiles called pterosaurs, and a variety of reptiles that had returned to the sea. The main groups of living reptiles are turtles, lizards, snakes, and crocodiles and their relatives. This traditional classification of reptiles excludes birds, a group of vertebrates that evolved special adaptations for flying. Biologists now recognize that birds have descended from a group of dinosaurs during the Mesozoic era. Birds form a clade nested among the organisms traditionally classified as reptiles. An early branch on the amniote tree led to mammals, a group of vertebrates with hair or fur, which produce milk to feed their young. Mammals increased in diversity and numbers after the extinction of the dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous period. The Cenozoic era is sometimes called the Age of Mammals because of their dominance. A few modern mammals still lay eggs. The platypus is an example. Marsupials give birth to live young at an early stage of development. The newborn crawls into a protective pouch on its mother's body to complete its development. Examples of this group are kangaroos and opossums. All other mammals, and most mammal species living today, are placental mammals. They're named for having a placenta, an organ that helps the exchange of nutrients and wastes between the mother and the developing offspring. Placental mammals give birth to offspring that are more developed than the young of marsupials. Some important groups of mammals are rodents, such as rats, squirrels, and beavers, bats, which are the only flying mammals, two large groups of hoofed animals, carnivores, such as cats, dogs, bears, and seals, insectivores, such as shrews, moles, and hedgehogs, and the group to which humans belong, the primates, which also includes lemurs, monkeys, and apes. It was a long climb, but we finally made it to the branch of the tree of life to which humans belong.